Welcome to Five Stripe Weekly. With wins against Sporting Kansas City and Toronto, Atlanta United are climbing up the table. But with a visit from that team from Florida this weekend, can Atlanta United make it four in a row? We discuss all that and more next. Welcome to the show, Five Stripe Fam. I'm AJ, this is Tanner McLeod. Before we get into it, become part of the notification squad by hitting the bell next to the subscribe button on YouTube or hop over from Facebook and subscribe. You can now also find all our content on the Genico USA platform anywhere in the world, Amazon Fire TV, Roku, iOS, Google Play, and many other streaming platforms. It's been a pretty decent week for the Five Stripes with two wins in the past week and three wins in a row overall. So let's get right into the SKC match review. And yeah, I mean, you know, 3-0 against a team that, yes, was depleted. Uh, it's a little bit of a theme for this week. But uh, either way, uh, we beat the team that was in front of us. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a team that we hadn't beaten before, which also is another check box. Um, it goes for two teams this week, them and Toronto. And two wins in a row against two more teams we had not yet beaten in MLS. Right, and so that leaves only, I think, a couple left. in uh, Seattle and Portland. Well, yeah. Portland, no. We technically did beat them. I forgot yeah, about that. Just not in the regular season. <laughs> but it's all good. It's all good. But we beat them in the game that counted the most. Exactly. But, um, yeah, in terms of this SKC match, uh, I mean, in a really raucous, uh, you know, Children's Mercy Park, uh, you know, we kind of did kind of subvert what we hadn't really done well this season, which was win big on the road. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, with a 3-0 win, yeah, it's uh, somewhat convincing, you know, again, against a depleted side. Oh, absolutely. Full disclosure, I watched Game of Thrones first. <laughs> so if anyone was wondering, I watched Game of Thrones. It ended perfectly as the first half ended. I watched the second half, then rewatched the first half. And it all worked out because I saw, well, the two goals in the second half and mm. one up, and it was much better than the episode of Game of Thrones. But that's right. not what we're here to talk about. That's what I apparently heard. Apparently, I don't watch Game of Thrones. Apparently, they had a Game of Thrones um, like Tifo at the match before the game um, that they lifted up. It was like the Night King. Yeah, yeah, that didn't Ish. work out. That didn't work out it well. It was, wasn't exactly a Tifo. It was a thing that they lifted up, and it was the oh Night for King. for SKC. SKC. Yeah, 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 yeah. It didn't go well for the Night King in previous no, yeah. episodes, and it didn't go well for SKC here either. True, but uh, also, I mean, uh, for Atlanta United, I mean, I think uh, in terms of I've lost this completely, where are we going? <laughs> oh, I was actually talking about the fact that I was actually bringing it all back around, getting the whole Game of Thrones thing in there, because it was a big question. Michael Parker's had a really funny tweet saying that nothing it's was happening. True. That's where I was going to go. Yes, Michael Parker's has that tweet saying nothing's <laughs> going to happen. He was right, full disclosure. Well, stuff did happen, yeah. but it wasn't How important. much information did he actually have? I don't know, but I mean, he wasn't exactly wrong, because it yeah. was pretty annoying. But to the good stuff, which was the fact that Atlanta United beat a team 3-0 on the road for their second consecutive clean sheet victory. Right. Mm -hmm. So the past two matches, 2-0 against New England, 3-0 against uh, SKC, yeah. five goals unanswered on the road. Mm -hmm. That's not bad stuff considering where Atlanta United had been. Right. And I mean, how often has Atlanta United gone away from home and kept clean sheets? Mm -hmm. It's not something that they usually do. And not only that, you saw Ezekiel Barker looking more confident, mm -hmm. got another good goal. Joseph yeah. Martinez, two goals, his confidence is clearly back. And Ezekiel Barker was running this show. Oh, he it was, was playing massive. very well. Yeah, and uh, this goal that he got, oh my god, uh, you know, scoring from outside of the box, really... Uh, again? Yeah, again, and it's also not even thinking that he would shoot from there. And, uh, Something really, he wasn't doing in exactly. like past seasons or even earlier yeah. this season. Mm -hmm. The fact that he now has the confidence to take yeah. these shots on, he clearly has the technique and the ability to bury them. Mm -hmm. And that adds another weapon to how Atlanta United can attack a team. Because clearly, the technique, the talent, the confidence is there. This is the player Atlanta United mm -hmm. went to go sign from Independiente. Right. Unfortunately now, he's gone for a month, but hopefully yeah. he can continue to run the show for the Argentina U20s at mm -hmm. the World Cup. Show some things on the international level, uh, and also, uh, you know, it's a good thing that uh, he went, in my eyes, to a degree. Uh, obviously, he can selfishly. only raise his value. Yeah, he can raise his value. He's uh, on the world stage on the U20s level. It's, uh, yeah, very great to see if... Uh, if he does really, really well as well. But well, the important thing about him yeah. leaving was, mm -hmm. could other people step up? Right. And we'll get to that in the Toronto game, but in this game, yeah. you started seeing signs of life from P.T. Martinez mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, very, very true, but also, I mean, something that um, was massive this match was the link-up play between Jose Martinez and Ezekiel Barco. I mean, it's something that uh, clearly we didn't miss in the, the next match, but 
I mean, we were very weary of, like, are we going to miss this? Because it was immaculate. I mean, they almost, uh, to some degree, were telepathically knowing where each, each other were because Jose Martinez knew exactly where to pass it for his Echo Barco's goal as well. So, yeah, I mean, uh, and it's also uh, Jose Martinez, uh, when he scores, you know, it's just starting that trend of when he scores, he scores in bunch bunches and so uh yeah i mean it's a uh, you know it all very much bodes well pt martinez uh was slotted in the middle in this match and i think though uh Ezekiel barco kind of uh was kind of more in the middle more so than what PT i think he definitely was took more of the the thunder of running the match but pt yeah. definitely was playing better mm -hmm. he was an improved performance which i think yeah. was important for him to start getting that confidence under his belt mm -hmm. and as a whole, the team against a team, like you said, that was undermanned, lots of injuries, yeah. it's still a job you have to go do on, a road, on the road. In yeah. a place where SKC, regardless of injuries, does not lose very many games basically ever. Against a team you had not yet beaten in Major League Soccer, you go out there, you get a convincing 3-0 win. Did SKC create some chances? They did, but mm -hmm. as a theme that continues on, they didn't put very many on target. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you're going to be in a great position to win. And that's what Atlanta United did. They took care of it and they needed that. They got three points. And then the next important step was building on that. And as we saw, that they definitely did that. Yeah, uh, and kind of quickly uh, getting through into the uh, the post-match quotes. Uh, yeah, Frank de Boer kind of talked about how he was still very adamant that uh, at that time, uh, he was asked if this was the uh, best played match that they uh, the Five Traps have played yet, and he was adamant that FC Dallas was still, uh, even though we had lost that match. Um, People might beg to differ on that Yeah, one. I think so, because it's still, like, I think he's trying to push home a point, but it is very much that, you know, finishing is very much part of a performance. And so if you don't finish, that's still, like, yeah, you didn't play well to a degree. So, I mean, I get what he's trying to say. It's just, uh, yeah, it's very funny that he's still trying to uh, to push that still. Um, but, uh, yeah, the rest of what he said, uh, yeah, he said that they, like, finally get the reward, which is the, the W, the three points, which I, I agree. I mean, yeah, there there is that uh, comment that he made about, you know, if we play this uh, 28 times out of uh, 30, we will win. But uh, was you know, this performance similar to FC Dallas. That's also what's interesting. I think that it was, it, it, it was, it was good performance, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a great performance. Yeah. That happened the next game, which yeah. we'll get into in a mm -hmm. second, but you needed to have a performance and a result like this to give you the confidence to mm -hmm. take that into the next game, knowing, okay, we're figuring out the system. We're figuring out how to move. We're mm -hmm. figuring out these passing combinations where players finally seem familiar with what they're trying to do on the pitch. It seems that you know, he kept talking about needing practice time and needing training time with the group so they understood what he wanted. And you started to see that against SKC and it gave them the confidence because confidence and momentum is such an important thing in all sport, but particularly in soccer, when if you feel things are going the right way, if the dressing room is together, you're pulling in the right directions, you can really start putting results down. And they needed to go and get that mm -hmm. against it again at a place where not a lot of teams win regardless right now they're drawing a lot there but still teams aren't beating them yeah so you go out there you put on a 3-0 performance you get the three points against a team at the beginning of the season who was a rival both for mls cup mm -hmm. and in concacaf champions league mm -hmm. who suffered like you in concacaf champions league so they're a quality team they just have issues but it doesn't matter What's been happening is Atlanta United hasn't been beating the teams that they should be beating. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia, Cincinnati, yep. they went out and they did it. They did it emphatically and then they built on that. And that is the important thing is to continue to build, to continue to progress, to continue to evolve and get better. Mm -hmm. And this team does finally look like it is evolving to yes. that next level. Right. And uh, yeah, I think Frank DeBoer is making the proper adjustments to the team as well and allowing them to thrive in what they're doing uh, in what they're best at doing really rather but uh yeah and uh, you know to finish up on the the quotes that he was talking about after the match uh he talked about ezekiel barco and uh pt martinez with the dad joke in there with uh it'd be a pity or uh, it's a pity that he's not here but we have another pity so he has to make the difference Ooh, yes, dad joke galore. Uh, I definitely but... see Frank DeBoer as a guy that makes lots of dad jokes. Like... But yeah, he's just so deadpan and uh, you know it's so dry that you may not even know if he's joking. But uh, yeah, this one he was definitely, it's a dad joke in there, I think. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it is what it is. It is a, uh, 
Woo! <laughs> I mean, humor. to be fair, to be fair, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people were making this PT joke, like, all off season. I'm pretty so, sure I yeah. was one of them. So, you he know. hasn't made a Breck Shea <laughs> pun yet, though. If he makes a Breck Shea oh, pun, God. that's when he'll fully endear himself to me. <laughs> oh, God. Gotta Breck the cycle. Oh, God. Oh, God. All right, but anyway, let's move on to the match review for the Toronto match. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, we're filming this on a Thursday, so... Uh, it was know, yesterday. It was yesterday, yesterday. exactly. But, uh, so it was that 2-0 win, and uh, pretty convincing all in all. Uh, really, all it lacked was clinical finishing, but... Um, if it had that, it would have been very lopsided. Yeah. Like, think indeed. New England. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But, uh, you know, what was, I think, notable about this match is how much kind of lack of the ball we actually had and really what we did with the ball is uh, really what's important because yeah we kind of played to what uh, like I said in the fan camps uh, what Tito Vijalba kind of does it's you know very swashbuckling you you know don't really uh, you pretty much risk a lot which is fine if you're creating a lot of chances that are genuine chances, and boy did we have a lot of genuine chances. Absolutely, the problem was, I think, the only issue you could really take, is again, the finishing and the clinical nature yeah. was not there, but you still won 2-0 convincingly. And like you said, it's not always about having the ball, which has kind of been my biggest beef and my issue with possession football sometimes is that possession for the sake of controlling the game, I can understand. Possession for the sake of possession, I, I, I'm not really a fan of it unless you're doing something with it. Yeah. And both SKC and Toronto played like they were trying to play the game, like they were right. trying to play open. Because of that, that's, yeah, that's Atlanta really United difference. has now space to operate and space yeah. to play. Mm -hmm. And there was a certain swagger, like swashbuckling type nature, like you said, yeah. to this team where at certain points in time, there were tricks and flicks, there were back heels and one touch and give and goes between PT and Nagmi and Joseph and, yeah, Tito. and Tito. And, and they were all oh. combining well. And mm -hmm. whenever they lost the ball, they went to go and try and get it back. But right. not only that, when they didn't have it, they gave Toronto no options. Mm -hmm. Toronto was consistently being caught offside mm -hmm. and had eight shots and put none of them on target. So yeah. it didn't matter that they were creating chances. None of them were ever coming close to the right. goal. That which is being what's said, interesting. Greg Vanny, after the match, was saying, oh, which is a theme uh, for teams that play us uh, at the Benz. And yeah, it's like, oh, we created chances. And it's the like best chances <laughs> they created was when we almost scored on ourselves. Like when yeah. Brad Guzan had made that suicidal pass that went wide. Yeah. And then when Brett Shea got caught on the ball on the left in the first half. Yeah. Those are the really two biggest chances that Toronto had. And aside from that, they did nothing with them. And those are more, not that they created them, but mistakes that Atlanta had made sure. that they did not capitalize Unforced on. Unforced errors that, uh, you know, gave them the best chance of scoring, sure. Uh, but in terms of, yeah, like what we were doing, um, yeah, like, I mean, it's uh, it's one of those, like, pretty much everybody had a chance to score. Absolutely. Like, I mean, but, everyone did. Yeah. But it was just a matter of, yes, this is one of those days that, uh, you know, it... Flatters Toronto to a degree in this match, uh, for sure. Uh, Tito, you know, could have had a, a more than two, probably. yeah, probably. Uh, but he, did. he hit the post when he that yeah. dribbled through everyone. Then he had that ball, long ball in the second half that he just couldn't get yeah, under control. Exactly. That you know he would have slaughtered. He had, he had already made that full run. It was it's an just, incredible yeah. ball over the top as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, was that who played that? I ball? think it was Guzan. <laughs> No, 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 that could right? have been all of it. I thought it was from one of the defenders. I thought it was like Miles Robinson or maybe Escobar or someone yeah. that played it from the right side of the defense. It okay. doesn't matter. Either way, Either it was way. an incredible ball. It was yeah. it was a type of long ball that that was the time to play it oh, because yeah. of the space in behind uh -huh. with a player like Tito running onto it. But the entire team looked comfortable within the system. They knew what they wanted to do, and that's something that hasn't been the case. Mm -hmm. And again, when you even think about the two goals that were scored, they were two pretty scruffy goals. I mean, it was oh, yeah. across, across uh, from Joseph off of a free kick from PC mm -hmm. that the keeper spills, and he gets it in there, and Tito gets a foot on it. Mm -hmm. And then Joseph drops the ball wide, Julian Gressler cuts on his left foot, and it hits a deflected shot in. Mm -hmm. But there were so many other chances that could have gone in. Like I said, Tito hit the post, uh, PT hit the crossbar, and I'm pretty sure there was definitely another time where it hit the woodwork at least once or twice in that game. And that's not even to say how much uh, Joseph Martinez was actually playmaking in this match, where, yeah, he would maybe, I, I think arguably, was maybe too passive in this, uh, where he probably, if it was last year, he probably would have put him away himself, uh, but, you know, he was chasing a, a record last year. So uh, this year, yeah, it makes more sense, and it's probably a little bit more in uh, Frank DeBoer's system he's as well. He's more of a complete to, forward as opposed right, to just that just a poacher or, or, or yeah. And he's, he's doing well, and I think the thing we talked about in the fan cam that I did with you was that, you know, 
Joseph was ineffective being used in that complete forward false nine, moves around mm. a lot, gets the ball deeper. He was ineffective earlier in the season, but now he's effective. He's playmaking. He's getting into the right areas and making that right pass and having players score. And that makes him so much more dynamic and adds another level to the, to the game of a player who is really, really good. Oh, yeah. And I mean, if, if you- He always had this in him, man, like, because- If he's a 20 goal, 10 assist guy a season, uh -huh. or 25 goal, 10 assist a season guy, that is incredible. Indeed, indeed. And I think it's also this. I mean, it's like he came in as a left winger. And so he was actually known for his dribbling um, and, you know, sort of a little bit uh, playmaking ability, he just never really got to show it a ton. I mean, he, as the, the lone striker a lot of times, I mean, he's relied on to score more than anything else, and so that's what he's kind of been more known as, but he's always had this in his game. It's just a matter of him being able to show it, and now he's finally been able to uh, show all facets of his game, and plus his work rate, and plus him being able to uh, control the box with his head uh, on defensive headers and whatnot Despite as well. Despite his size. Yeah. I mean, that's he's usually the guy Oh, he, that, ha he hit the crossbar off a header, didn't he? Didn't yeah, he have the I one that, that, that kind of like came off of it and hit the crossbar and went over off of that cross from Julian Gressel in the yeah. first half? I mean, yeah. that was just one of those games where the only thing you could criticize was the poor finishing. But at the end, for me, one of the things that shown out, the, that shown the most was PC Martinez yeah. because he was incredible. Yeah, the game. free kick that led to the goal. Um, the free kick that hit the crossbar. Exactly. The time where he dribbled through pretty much the entire Toronto team and then yeah. just got knocked over in the box. It uh -huh. wasn't a penalty, I don't think. Yeah. But he still dribbled past everyone. He had a chance to pull the trigger mm -hmm. at the top, like middle of the 18. I was just like, oh, shoot yeah. it. But he didn't. But he, he looked so confident on mm -hmm. the ball. He looked like he was enjoying playing right. the game of football again, which is something yeah. that he wasn't doing so far this right. season. Yeah, and I think it's also this. It's like, uh, you know, I think you could hear the, the fans cheering for him, even if he uh, missed the shot just a little bit wide. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that I think uh, the fans really saw that this match not only was really, really entertaining to watch because of, uh, you know, the nature of how they were playing, uh, it really got to, I think, uh, maybe some nostalgia of, like what we are accustomed to watching from the Five Stripes. And so I think really the question is, is uh, is this really Frank de Boer's, you know, system per se? I or think so. You know, well, or is it more of an amalgamation of, you know, what it was previously with uh, a little bit of the ideas that he tried to, you know, implement early on? I and think so, so which is, is the perfect place where I think it should be right now. Mm -hmm. I think it's the perfect place where it should be right now because there was a lot of, there was still a lot of sideways passing at times, mm -hmm. but there was zest to it. It was mm -hmm. quick, there was yes. tempo. The ball was being played with purpose and being recycled quickly. Mm -hmm. Players were involved moving much more, their runs were much more decisive. Mm -hmm. And the ball was, the, every time the ball was played, whether it was played backwards, forward, sideways, it was for a reason to get to a point and it right. got there quickly. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you move the opposition around. When you move mm -hmm. the opposition around, you create space and you create change. Chances. And Atlanta have been creating chances, but maybe not always clear cut. But also, again, this team played with the confidence and almost a freedom that maybe they hadn't been given before. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they just weren't confident at all, so they did not have the ability to make that step. Right. And that's, again, why confidence is so important in this game. Mm -hmm. When you believe, like we talked about a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, mm -hmm. when you believe your pass will come off, yeah. when you believe your You're shot will score. go in, yeah. when you believe that you can take a man off the dribble and beat him, when you have that confidence, things happen for you. Indeed. And right now, Atlanta United has that confidence, which is something that they have been desperately craving. And they're getting the results to back it up. Right. Because three wins in a row and three clean sheets to boot, that's not something I expected. That's not something this team has historically done. And yeah, right now, they have one of the best defensive records in the league. They do, exactly. We've only let in eight goals this year, and that's, I think, tied for least with LAFC. And so, I mean, that bodes pretty well. It's just, yeah, I think early on, it's it was that difference of we were not clinical, we weren't uh, maybe scoring first, and that also is a huge factor in how a match will go. Uh, I think I think the, the stats kind of generally say if you score first, you probably have the highest chance of winning. But um, yeah, I, I think with this match, uh, though, yes, we do need to know again that this team was heavily rotated uh, Toronto FC, and so yes, no Altidore, no uh, you know uh, Mabinga, you know you have guys that uh, you know are key cogs in their team, and Pozuelo pretty much was probably left on an island, and still probably is uh, somewhere in Aeroformetti's pocket, and with that, I mean it's yeah, you know you have 
pretty much neutralized though a guy that what four was goals one of the and five highest players in MLS so far yeah. this season. I mean, you have Carlos Vela, and then you have everyone else, and of yeah. everyone else, Pozuelo was probably the best yeah. of the bunch with some of the goals and the playmaking that he had been doing. And that was one of those things that the team looked so cohesive and disciplined defensively. LGP was making his crazy man runs in to pressure the ball, but he was being covered behind him by Eric Hermetti or Miles Robinson or whoever it was. There was right. cover there. There was the movement and the rotation, almost the total football of if mm -hmm. a player takes a position, someone else takes his, mm -hmm. and you keep that structure. And that was happening. And mm -hmm. this was... Did Toronto play into Atlanta's hands a little bit by being so gung-ho? Yes, you'd have to ask questions of their mm -hmm. manager if you're rotating the side. You must be confident to do that, but if that's the case, if he's confident in his team that they can play that style of football, mm -hmm. then that shouldn't take any shine off the fact that Atlanta would be the team that was rotated because their mm -hmm. manager believed they were good enough to come in here and get a result. Mm -hmm. And Atlanta, United, again, beat a team in front of them at home where sometimes that can prove to be difficult because of how negative teams play. That's true. So they took care of business two, two games in a row against two quality opponents that they hadn't beaten before. Mm -hmm. Life might not be so bad. And if this is the direction this team is going, if a team plays like this 20 out of 30 games, they will win. I believe Frank DeBoer. Yeah, this if, is the if, way it's, that they play. if it's this match where, I mean, you know, they're actually clinical, then of course. But, I mean, you know, that's uh, that's kind of easy to say maybe then in that regard. But, but if, again, if this is the goal, if this is the style that he wants to play at yeah. this tempo with this pace, mm -hmm. then if they keep playing this way yes. and you bring in Ezekiel Barco back and you yeah. add a Justin Miriam in oh, there, yeah. which we'll get on to uh -huh. in a little bit, you have quality and right. you will score goals. And that's the difference between this match and FC Dallas was that there wasn't that high tempo. There wasn't uh, crisp passing, really. Mm. I think that's really the difference Passing here as with well. purpose, the movements exactly. with purpose, the runs yeah. with purpose, mm -hmm. the ball getting there on time. Indeed, indeed. And so, yeah, I think this match uh, is definitely more of the kind of staple that we should be kind of looking towards to Yes, uh, you know, if it's against higher opposition, maybe it might not be a 3 0. And so, you know, that's really where the tests are going to come. And hopefully, yeah, I mean, hopefully we can see uh, an extrapolation of this. But to answer uh, kind of my question earlier about is this an amalgamation, uh, I think that's really truly what it is is that uh, there is the defensive stoutness of what it was earlier in the season where yes I mean they focused a ton in uh, the uh, the preseason about uh, defense and about really keeping um, you know the shape of uh, the defense and everything but I think uh, now you're seeing more of the um, you know the ideas from yesteryear with a little bit of the pressing with a little bit of um, you know hitting more on the counter and using that pace to beat teams uh, with through balls in behind that's moving really quickly in transition mm -hmm. to get the ball forward into the final right. third when the and other dynamic, team hasn't recovered and dynamic attack as well yes. where it's not the same like cross being pumped from the same side over and over. Because uh, the ball was coming from the left, from the right, the yeah, middle. Atlanta the top, United took it from every ball. single. They took yeah. every single bullet they had in terms of a way to attack them, and they and they threw it at Toronto. And Toronto yeah. didn't know where the ball was going to come from, and that left them unbalanced and unsure. And because of that, chance after chance came. They took two, and that was at the end of the day all that they needed. I agree. I agree. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, let's get to the post-match quotes from Frank de Boer. Uh, he talked a lot about the players and whatnot, but I think we should highlight. PT's performance here uh, because I think this is definitely his best match yet uh, for you know just the amount of uh, you know crisp passing that he had the free kicks were pretty much mostly his tonight I mean or last night uh, I mean he you know he didn't have to share it with Ezekiel Barco it's pretty much like he had to run the show and you know creatively wise I think uh, you know we all saw uh, why he you know is the South American Player of the Year, and you know now it's only about just putting it all together for assists and goals, so that yes, stat sheets uh, look pretty at the end of the day. But don't tell that to Darlington Nagby because he's been balling. He out. has been God. incredible. But specifically, yeah. what Frank De Boer had to say was, mm -hmm. I think PT was improving. Everybody could see that. You saw some highlights of what he can bring to the team. So that's why I also let him play for 90 minutes. I know there is another game coming up quick, but still, sometimes you have to get a feeling for playing 90 minutes. He was very close to making a goal or an assist tonight. I think he can be satisfied with his performance tonight. This is a good start for him for sure. So 
again, it was there. The performance was there. He felt comfortable. He looked comfortable. He's starting to get to where he can get to. Mm -hmm. And if a PT Martinez gets going to, to 100% and starts rolling at the pace that he can, mm -hmm. and you bring in Ezekiel Barco back, we already talked about this a second ago, the dearth of attacking options that Atlanta had have. There's so much there. Right. And it, that makes the them incredibly is, dangerous mm -hmm. going forward. The question is, is if they can play together uh, on a consistent basis against team after team and still be able to coexist on the same pitch. Hopefully they can. I mean, I think they can. Yeah, I think they can, but it's a matter of, you know, we kind of haven't really seen it until SKC where uh, both of them were thriving, you know, because they generally occupy the same areas if you look, them, look at them on a heat map. It's, you know, they're pretty much popping up in the, in the same spot. I think spots, the, the thing but... that's important is that you saw it a couple times in this match where it worked with Tito and Joseph, where Joseph would drop deeper, kind of go a little bit to the left, and Tito yeah. would make a run to the middle. The more that they play together, the more fluid they'll become. And mm -hmm. that's key to, to this system, is if that fluidity. So if you can have Pizzi and Barco being able to move back and forth and occupy different positions, it really confuses defenders because mm -hmm. each of them offers a little bit of a different type of game and how they attack them. And if you're constantly having them pop up in different areas, mm -hmm. that makes it very difficult for teams to figure out where's your mark, where's the guy to mark, where's the guy gonna run, what ball's he gonna play? Especially, yeah, it's like that. Like uh, if you're playing against one one guy the entire night and uh, you know I think kind of during the probably the maybe middle of the match uh, where you're both of you probably are still uh, as fit as each other generally um, you can kind of really shut them down possibly because you know what their next move is going to be if you've been you know uh, defending them all night and you know I think uh, when you have guys coming from which side to another side and uh, you have to defend against a Tito Bijalba and then defend it against a Gressel and you know they they do offer different attributes that uh, can really make it difficult on you if say one you lack pace and you know all of a sudden you have to uh, defend against a Tito Bijalba it's cool that's scary prospect. And that's right? one of those things that's a real, again, a real highlight of this system that you would see at Ajax or at Barcelona, where you'll have guys move around. Sometimes you'll have guys overload certain wings, where you'll have maybe a Tito and a Barco both on the left at the same time, mm -hmm. or a PT comes out of the left with a Tito, or whoever it is, and you have multiple guys out there. And now the defenders are going, what's going on? There's more of them than there are of us. And it makes you so unpredictable because you have players popping up all over the place. So the the defense can never get a read on mm -hmm. what your move is because as soon as they might have a read on one player, mm -hmm. the next player comes up and then they don't know what to do. And if mm -hmm. Atlanta United can get that fluid movement in its forward line, that's not something that happens a lot at a high level in general, but to have it happen in Major League Soccer would make them incredibly deadly at, mm -hmm. at the front. And considering they've been playing so much better at the back, mm -hmm. this team might be a whole lot better than we thought it was a couple weeks ago. Right, indeed. And uh, I think, yeah, to note, uh, yeah, Shea played left back at, in this match and Parky played, of course, uh, at left back in the SKC match. That really was the, uh, you know, like no one could have guessed that Parky was going to play uh, at left back at SKC and then people were actually clamoring for him uh, against Toronto. Now, uh, the biggest thing about Shea in this match, as our buddy Jay Riddle uh, showed in his uh, Twitter uh, thread about the mistakes that uh, Breck Shea made in this match, Yes, I think going forward, uh, he was creating chances and arguably had uh, created the most chances in the first half. Uh, like he had three chances that he created and the rest of the team had three chances. Uh, and so going forward, he was uh, doing quite well, but it was defending wise, yes, he was a little bit maybe out to sea. And that's where a lot of people uh, in the stadium, maybe either through preconceived notions of, uh, you know, what kind of player he is uh, and whatnot, uh, are booing him and uh, maybe you know it's not giving him the proper chance of uh, you know to do well because yeah you have the you know the relative um, argument of a Chris McCann who yes probably was offering a net negative early on and I think kind of during the middle of his tenure was at least uh, at left back doing some things that he was actually uh, you know putting in a good cross he was defending at least uh, quite well at least in the middle of his tenure um, that he was actually contributing something with uh, his production I think we just have to unfortunately uh, you know get through this moment where yes Breck Shea is the starter uh, yes he has his defensive liabilities but uh, I think I don't know I mean I'm not 
I'm not gonna boo him every single yeah. time he you know makes a mistake. I think there's plenty of players on the pitch that make a mistake uh, during the game, and yes, uh, you know he uh, made some mistakes that maybe could have cost us the goal, but, but they didn't. Yeah, at the end of the day, they have not. He uh, hasn't done enough to deserve that treatment yet, as far right. as I'm concerned. I mean, I said he wasn't. He hasn't scored an own goal. I, yeah, I, I, I said like he wasn't. Led to, uh, he wasn't at his best. Know. He was a bit poor defensively. That's you know? fair. That's a fair criticism. But you don't. I don't think he needs the. But it's not like again, he hasn't got like a straight red card for some yeah. stupid nonsense. He hasn't cost this team yeah. any more than anyone else has this season, as far as I'm concerned, in the poor performances. And I think almost he's that lone standout that's still having those early season performances held against him. Is he the best? No, but he's an yeah. option there, mm -hmm. and he pulls on the shirt. And it has the and a badge on the front of it, yeah. so we have to support him. If he plays bad, obviously, yes, that's frustrating. But there's no need to boo him. That's or go after him on social media or anything like that. That's not going to help the situation right. at all. He's not going to so, play better because of that. He's like in terms of uh, probably uh, a guy like this who's probably really laid back. Uh, you know, in terms of that. If you boo him, it's probably not going to really like fire him up anymore. It's not. Yeah, it just seems counterintuitive, yeah, I think, probably, but... in this this, uh, this regard. But anyway, uh, so to wrap all that up, then, uh, I mean, it's... Two wins, yeah. two clean sheets, five goals, nine points out of the last nine, yeah. and climbing our way up the table. Right. Encouraging stuff. Uh, does this mean that we're back? I mean, uh, Easy. Let's, not, yeah, let's not get there quite yet. <laughs> Ask me that question at the end of this month. Exactly. Because, uh, yeah, there's that's pretty much uh, what it will be around 14, 15 games or so. Um, that will be close to the halfway point, essentially, of the season. And, uh, yeah, I think that's where you know the proper assessment probably can be made. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's get into the news then, guys. So uh, Ezekiel Barco uh, and Jose Martinez made MLS Team of the Week, and Ezekiel Barco was named uh, MLS Player of the Week for the second time for the second time this season already. And also, he won uh, today on Thursday the MLS Goal of the Week, which for the second time for the second time, which yes. Uh, Yes, Christian Roldan's uh, goal was quite good, uh, but you know it's it's this it's it's not quite uh, apples to apples. I think it's one's a finessed one and one's a rocket. So you know it it was pretty much Seattle's fan base versus Atlanta's fan base, and, and we won. Yeah, and we won. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where you know I think probably uh, in this point at this uh, you know juncture for like fans, they probably are voting against what is the, in the best interest of Atlanta United fans. And uh, so I guess we in still terms of won. Atlanta United fans on social media, yeah. we're back because yeah. we have options to vote for, and exactly. we're always going to win if that's up to our. If it's up to us, that's we'll true. win on social media every right. time, undefeated on social media. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so uh, yeah, with that, I mean, a quite a good week for uh, Ezekiel Barco, and of course, uh, yeah, he goes away with the U20s as we said before. Uh, Pretty much for a month, uh, because up I think up to Poland. Yeah, up to Poland, which uh, isn't too far. It's uh, and it's a, it's the summer, yeah, pretty much. So it should be okay. Yeah. But the fun thing is, he's actually not the only Atlanta United player. Right. He's the only first team player. Right. But Atlanta United also has Yet. Guillermo, yeah, Guillermo Bedintes, who will represent Panama, and Wesley Decas, who mm -hmm. represent Honduras. Both of them will also be joining those teams for the Under Twenty World Cup. Right. So good both luck of them of Atlanta United, United too. too. So good luck to both of them as well as well. Well, as Ezekiel Barco, hopefully the Five Stripes can put on a great show over in Poland. Indeed, and Atlanta United made a trade this week. That's uh, the big news. <laughs> yeah, that's the big news there. Uh, a very surprising one, actually. Happened very quickly. Super quickly, because usually, yeah, these rumors kind of go on for a minute, but uh, because of the transfer window uh, ending, yeah, you pretty much, uh, yeah, like this one had to be accelerated. It was basically Frank DeBoer coming out and saying he was looking to sign an attacker before the, the window closed, mm -hmm. and then just like that, Bish Bash Bosh. Yep. Hello, Justin Miram. Yeah, Justin Miram from the Columbus Crew, uh, also formerly of that team from Florida as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, the past uh, year or so has not been kind uh, with his form. Uh, he pretty much, he's had one assist, I think. In, well, like, the fun thing about that is yeah. he shows exactly what can happen if your fan base is a bunch of dickheads exactly. and sends you shit like death threats. Exactly. It's not going to help a person play better. In fact, they won't want to play for you yep. at all. Yeah, and even if they score, they'll put their fingers in their ears. And uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, so essentially though, Justin Miram was acquired for $100,000 in general allocation money, GAM. 
and uh, the club's natural second round selection in the 2020 MLS Super Draft. So to put which, this into normal terms, we yeah. traded a bag of Skittles and three Doritos exactly. to get this man. Whereas that team from Florida traded the house to get him, and then exactly. Columbus traded half of a house to get him back, and then Atlanta had basically just taking on its salary for a player who historically is not a bad option in Major yeah, League he Soccer. He hasn't been. Uh, yeah, I think he scored, what, 14 goals in 2017. I think he had seven or eight assists. Uh, I mean, a pretty decent season then. Uh, he is 30 years old now. So in terms of uh, him being a starter, he probably is not. He's more of a depth type of guy. And like he's brought yeah, a quality depth guy because he's played in a possession-based system, which is the system that we're playing. And also, uh, you know, he comes kind of ready-made for this. And so he doesn't, he's already kind of match fit already. Um, yeah, he's maybe not producing to what his, uh, you know, level has been, but, uh, you know, he doesn't really need to be. That's what's beautiful is that now we have options while maybe a Joseph Martinez is away, a Tito Pijalba is away on international duty. Um, yeah, just a lot of guys that will be going away later uh, and we will need options. And so this is a guy that, you know, if he performs for us, fantastic. But it's also a guy that, um, you know, I think kind of to a degree is a warm body. I think, but, but for me, it's a low risk, high reward yes. thing because you gave away next to nothing. Pretty to much, yeah. A second round. We didn't even happy. sign our second round pick exactly. this past season. Like, so they're worth that and a hundred thousand in GAM is nothing yeah. for this guy. And for context, also super draft uh, things like are kind of dwindling in that regard, where they're kind of looking to do away with the Super Draft in the future. It's just like a toss-in, like here's yeah. a cherry. Like that, they were the three Doritos. Yeah. Like the 100,000 was the pack of Skittles. That was literally not, not a bag of Doritos, not like a little th three literal Doritos. That's all we gave them. And they gave yeah. them a Justin Miro. Yeah, hopefully it's not the, uh, was, is it called the, the uh, Pokey? Uh, the, the spicy oh, thing. Uh, Hopefully it's not anything like that where it's like a surprise. And oh like, yeah, and it's so. just like this is... Uh, well, it's not our problem because we gave them to them, so this Columbus is Doritos now. Whatever That's they want to do with them, I don't know. Maybe they can that is very true. eat them on a rainy day in Columbus <laughs> and make them feel better. I indeed, don't know. indeed. But uh, yeah, so um, you know, it's a, it's a uh, very, like you said, Low risk, high reward signing, and hopefully it works out for us. He probably and might uh, be in the squad against that team for Florida. And he used to play for. Yeah, could see his debut. We don't know. That'd be great um, if he yeah. scored. And uh, I think it's just a matter of him getting integrated into the, the team uh, with training sessions. And so at, le at least on the defensive end, he knows what he's doing. Because I mean, if you start him and he doesn't know what his role is defensively, that uh, probably is not a good idea. He so. does have some familiarity with the team already, though, because yeah. he played with the captain, Michael Parkhurst, in Columbus last time they made MLS Cup a few years back. So there is a familiarity between him and someone on this team, and what a better person to have right. as a friend than your captain, right. Michael Parkhurst. Indeed, indeed. And uh, also to note, he is an Iraqi, Iraqi uh, international, but he was born in Michigan, and so I believe he is an American citizen. And so he does not count as uh, an international for one of the international slots. School in Michigan. He went to University of Michigan for yeah. college. So. so, and he speaks English quite well, actually. So it's uh, you know, it's like it's I'm, not a big deal. Yeah, he, we're good. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> but anyway, uh, let's move on to another good, good piece of news for the Atlanta United fans is that the driver's license plate, not driver's license, the license plate uh, that you can have with Atlanta United as uh, you know the side of it with. Uh, Five stripes it's in the sort of the seven stripes, I think now. Is it now? I think oh. it's the seven stripes on it. Uh, no star, unfortunately, but they. You can uh, put one on there. You can put one on there. Yes. Uh, just stick it. Just. I don't know if it'll stay with all the, the crazy weather that we get sometimes, but uh, you can pre-order them on May 28th, and so uh, that law has just been passed. Fantastic news for those that wanted a driver's license. Uh, license plate. License plate. My God. But um, yeah, and so uh, yeah. Fantastic for that, and we can show our fandom even more in the city. And uh, not like you don't see like the stickers on cars all over the place anyway, but now license plates all over the, all over the shop. I'm true. fine with it. Yeah, indeed, indeed. But um, yeah, so let's move on to Atlanta United too. They played Nashville SC uh, with their at, terrible logo. <laughs> that's uh, you know, 
They, Nashville fans agree with me on that, <laughs> so I don't even feel like I'm sure. going out on a limb there, even though yeah. they don't like it. Yeah. So. Uh, but uh, yeah, at Fifth Third Bank, they unfortunately took a 2 0 loss at Lane A2. Um, and yeah, I mean, it, it is what it is. They, it's one of those games. Will Vent yeah. one goal in the fourth minute to start things off. Yeah. Second goal came in the 11th, and you had George Campbell sent off in the 76th. It was just. One of those days. One of those days, but uh, I think it's, you know, this is an extremely young side at this point. Uh, I think, uh, I think a Conway and Romario Williams did play up top, but I mean, yeah, it, it is what, what it is, I think, you know, with this uh, this game. It's just, you know, it's going to be up and down, I think, for the twos and the reserve squad. It's they had a great like start. Good. They've hit a bit of a rough patch right yeah. now, but they're young. It's for experience, so hopefully they can get that experience, kick on, continue to improve, mm -hmm. and as long as they can make the first team one day, that's what really matters. Exactly, exactly. But, uh, guys, that does it for the news and gets us to the mailbag. And you guys send in these questions through IG Story. Please continue to do so, and we might answer your question in the future. First question comes from underscore Joe Morton underscore. Do you think Joseph will be able to match his 2018 goal tally? No. Yeah, I think uh, I think at this pace, it's, it's probably... It's a record, though, to be fair. Yeah, like... it's, it's not going to probably happen, but I think if he can contribute 20 goals and 10 assists, then it's arguably a very... Um, you know, similar season, similar season, and almost as productive of a season if you look at the goal contributions as a whole. Um, Can but, he contribute, say, thirty-five goals mm -hmm. all the way through the season, whether that be goals and assists combined? Mm -hmm. He might be able to do that, but I mean, he, it's it's the record for most goals scored in a single season right. for a reason. It's never been done before. He was on an incredibly like toward goal scoring pace yeah. last year, so for him to do that well again, especially mm -hmm. after the start the team's gotten off to, who knows? Maybe PT and Barco and everyone clicks and comes in and he starts scoring goals left, right, yeah. and center. I wouldn't That'd be doubt. Great. I wouldn't doubt Joseph Martinez at any point. I mean, he. Pretty much, uh, if he gets hot, I mean, he he can get ridiculous. It, it's like stupid good. And sometimes he does fancy he a hat trick really or a really good goal against the team this weekend as well. Exactly. So. And so you know, uh, you know, he can really push that uh, that kind of record of hat tricks in MLS even further. Uh, and then maybe that can get him to that point where he might be, uh, you know, going against his own record. Uh, but I think, yeah, Carlos Vela or a Zlatan this year probably have the best chance. Hopefully uh, neither with their of them pace. do it. <laughs> yeah, the, the pace of uh, the, you know, amount of goals that they have right now. But uh, next question comes from Jair Raimondo02. Should Atlanta still be careful of DeBoer? I mean, it's like, be careful. I think right now the only thing they yeah. have to be careful of is still tempering their expectations. We've been yeah. gushing this whole episode, I'm not mm -hmm. I'm not going to lie, but mm -hmm. that's because it was an entertaining match and there's progress there. Mm -hmm. And there's stuff to be excited about. If you can't get excited about four runs out of five, four clean sheets, three wins on the bounce, and a performance like they had against Toronto, then maybe this isn't the sport for you. <laughs> but they're playing better. Can things still have issues? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You can have that with any manager in the world. But things seem to be heading in the right direction right now. Mm -hmm. And for me, and I can I feel like I can speak for you as well, at the end of the day, it's about supporting the club and supporting the team, win or lose. And right now, they're doing well. Let's keep backing them. We backed them when they were doing poorly. We got to back them, obviously, when they're winning. So yeah. I think things are heading in the right direction. Back the manager, and I think we'll be okay. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it, it is to this degree. Yes, we... Uh, to answer the question, should we be careful? I mean, yes, uh, in that regard where, uh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't put all of the eggs in the basket, but, you know, we're slowly putting some eggs in there where it's like, okay, yeah, you're doing this better, you're adjusting, you're making, uh, you know, kind of uh, things kind of that were making people mad and, you know, doing away with them to that regard, so. Like the 3-4-3. Three, yeah, like the 343, which, I mean, yeah, I think people, I think, had a right to have an issue with it because, yeah, I mean, there were a lot of things that uh, I think clearly were wrong with the team, and he's kind of solved that now a little bit with uh, kind of kind of loading the midfield a little bit more because that's really, that was our Achilles a little bit because we were getting overrun all the time. And so, you know, it's just these adjustments that he keeps making, yeah, I mean, I think more and more of our eggs can go into that basket. But uh, last question comes from Atlanta United Reactions. Not a question, but if Miram scores a hat trick versus Orlando, I'll get a Miram tattoo. We're gonna hold you to this. Hold you to that, yep. <laughs> so if he does it. So if it happens, not that I think it will, wait. 
Here's the thing, he didn't specify if it was this game, so if he does it in the second game, that counts too, right? This is true. So you didn't, you true. weren't specific, you just said if he scores a hat trick versus Orlando. So if he scores a hat trick against Orlando at any point in time, Atlanta United reactions, I expect a Miriam tattoo. Just Indeed. saying, that's what specificity is for. You missed the ball on that one. Yeah. But uh, that does it for the mailbag. Thank you for asking those questions, guys. We appreciate it very, very much. But I think uh, it was the first mention of that team from Florida this game. Yeah, I think it might have been. Well, perfect timing. Yeah, because this is our match preview. It's Orlando City. It's 2.30 on Sunday at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. And nationally televised. Yeah, nationally Fox. televised. It's probably going to be, I think it is uh, opened up to 70,000 in the upper bowl. Is. It is. And so, uh, you know, it's uh, the team that always plays us tough, but they haven't beat us. And, uh, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, you know, going through the previous matchups, uh, you know, it's been, it was a 1-0 win, of course. That was the goal of the season from yeah. the Lions Hammer. Right, uh, and that was in Orlando. Uh, it was that 1-1 draw at Bobby Dodd. Again with a goal from the Lions Hammer. Indeed, uh, and then there was a 3-3 draw that at Mercedes. Madness. That was Jose Martinez pretty much willing his way hat -trick. to uh, a hat-trick and getting us uh, back into the game. Uh, and then in 2018, yeah, we pulled off the trifecta with uh, three wins against them. 2-1, 4-0, 2-1. So, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, in terms of their form lately, Orlando, uh, that's three L's, one draw, and two... Uh, two W's, so it's been inconsistent. Yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of the picture of inconsistency there. Uh, they've beat a you know Red Bulls team that has been pretty poor this season as well. If uh, you know some of the fans in our comments uh, of their fans uh, are saying that we are poop, then uh, I mean pretty much you know I think Red Bulls. They would be poop as well. Yeah, it's not great. Not ideal. <laughs> but that being said, they lost their last match out this past weekend, 2-0 at home. Yep. The same Toronto team that Atlanta United just dispatched back to Canada. Uh -huh. So in terms of recent opponents, there's a little marker for who has done what against two. And in terms of the odds in this match, yeah, Bet365 is not doing Orlando a solid. They have Atlanta United to win at 4-9, which translates to a 69.2% chance to win. The draw is at 15-4, which is a 21.1% chance. And Orlando City to win at a long 5-1, a 16.7% chance to win. So clearly, the odds makers very much look at the form of these two teams against each other mm -hmm. and in this season and very much favor Atlanta United to take all three points. And why was that so skewed towards us? It's because Orlando City have failed to win in 17 of their last 18 away matches. That's... Wow. Meanwhile, uh, Atlanta are undefeated in 16 of their last 17 home matches. Right. So, it's a, yeah. Yeah, and, and so to a degree, I mean, it's right in line with uh, their form, and hopefully it continues. But uh, there's also, there's been uh, under two and a half goals scored in six of Orlando City's last seven away games. So that's... Also interesting to note. That shows that they can yep. bunker and mm -hmm. play successful successful defense. Some yeah. of the it will some of the strengths that Toronto will threaten us with though is they can protect a lead when they get one. They can come back when they're in a losing position. Mm -hmm. And they're dangerous from direct free kicks. So Atlanta United can't be kicking them about and fouling them in and around the box. The problem yeah. is conversely what they struggle at. Defending against skillful players, defending against counterattacks, avoiding individual errors, and keeping possession of the ball, as well as defending against attacks down the wings, which pretty much is everything that Atlanta United is good at. Yeah, and it's pretty much, they're bad at defending, it seems, but that's, you know, hopefully something that we can kind of, uh, you know, exacerbate and uh, continue to make sure that they are that poor at. But, um, yeah, and uh, so in terms of, the, uh, the players that we need to watch in this match and uh, something that they, they are good at is playing on the wings. And so, uh, yeah, Nani is gonna be super, super lethal for them. This is a player but... that both you and I have a lot of familiarity with. Me, good history. Yeah. Him, not so much. Not so much and not a guy that I really, uh, yes, maybe at a later age and where he's, you know, maybe uh, a little bit more hot-headed even now, I think. Uh, Is that possible? Yeah, no. Yeah. I'm still salty about the red card against him <laughs> in 2013. But uh, yeah, it's a guy that uh, if he's attacking down a left side, we 
you should be very weary. Um, Honestly, but, attacking from anywhere. Because one of the things that Nani is good at, again, full disclosure, if you don't know, I'm a Manchester United fan. Nani played at Manchester United mm -hmm. for a very long time. He is very good on the ball. He has... He has he's one of those players that has a spectacular in his locker. Yeah. He can be very enigmatic and frustrating at times as well because he'll lose the ball, but he can score a 35 yard screamer after dribbling past three people and doing a, like a rainbow flick over someone's yeah. head. This is the type of player that Luis Nani is. He can pull off the spectacular, which is a problem for Atlanta United because if they give him space and they give him the chance, he will take his opportunities and he will try to do that. He has played at the highest level of the game for a very long time. He hasn't been playing at that level for a little bit, but that doesn't mean that he still does not have the ability to create some magic in his locker. Right. Uh, but this season, he has five goals and one assist in nine appearances. Uh, Dom Dwyer is another guy, of course, that uh, we should be looking he's at. Always to plays make sure. decently against Atlanta. Yeah, he has scored well. against us a, a good bit as well. So uh, he's at three goals and one assist this season. Uh, in 10 appearances. Uh, also, that's five of them as a starter and five of them as a substitute, so that's interesting. So he could provide something. Mm -hmm. He did start their last game against Toronto, but if he does not start, he could provide them with something off the bench. So he will right. be involved some way. Him and Nani, I think, in terms of going forward, mm -hmm. those are two players that probably will have the most attention paid to them. Indeed, indeed. But uh, also, uh, Atesho Akindele, uh, who's a forward for them, with two goals and one assist, uh, and also John Moutinho, not that John Moutinho, but the uh, the younger one that uh, was drafted in the MLS Super Draft. Wait, uh, was he the one that was drafted by LA that got sent off against yes. us last season? Yeah. Oh, so his last Indeed. trip here went really well. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, if he continues to want to, uh, you know, handball it in the box, that's totally fine. That'd be great. I'm fine with that. But um, yeah, he's pretty strong defensively and pretty decent on the ball. But it's uh, a guy that's I think yeah, if you can get into his head, then yeah, we could probably uh, run at him. And uh, I think run at him we might with a Franco Escobar and a Julian Gressel on that right side. So uh, he's not bad defensively, but yeah. if you can overload him, he's a and young put guy. him in a bad situation with what again seventy thousand people in a cauldron like that. I right. don't. Uh, he could be a player that might wilt under that pressure. Exactly, like he did last. Like season. he did last. Season. Right. So that is a key to this game, and so uh, we'll get to the other keys in this match. Where yeah, I think. Uh, we should have to look to score first like we always should try to do and uh, really go for the throat because it's a team that, um, yeah, I mean, if we haven't lost against them, like we shouldn't try to uh, do anything but try to win this game. Absolutely. I think this is a team that if Atlanta United can score first, especially if they can score early, they might really be able to kick the door on yep. this team because the confidence is already going to be there building off the performances they've had. And if you can take away the confidence that you know that Orlando will come in because they're going to come in looking to play spoil. They're going to come in confident, looking to be that team that beats Atlanta United at home because they want this victory a lot. If you can come in and punch them in the mouth and get mm -hmm. a goal early mm -hmm. and set the tempo for the game, Atlanta United might be on for another big result like they had last season in that 4-0 thrashing we had to them at home. Mm -hmm. So the interesting part though is that Orlando City is not going to play the same type of game as Sporting Kansas yeah. City or Toronto. Mm -hmm. They will sit deep, they will play to frustrate, they'll try to be compact defensively and mm -hmm. hit Atlanta on the counter with players like Nani and Dom Dwyer. Basically what Manchester United did to Arsenal every single time we played them and Nani played for us. He scored a few goals against Arsenal like that. Yeah. Um, anyway. Okay, yeah, enough of that talk but over the, there. The talk but... is, is that Atlanta United will have to be able to break down. I, look, first off, European Cup Final. Yes, it's the Europa League. Man United are dreadful. Let me have my moment. I don't have any of them anymore because we're so bad. Uh, but oh, yeah, of the let's let's get let's get to that. Uh, of the top five sides, if you will, even um, yeah, which one is not in a European final? The city of Manchester is not in a European <laughs> final. Yes, I'm fine about the blue half. Yeah, my half. <sighs> yep, yep, yep. But um, not good. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of good though, Atlanta yeah. will have to be able to move the ball quickly, like they did against Toronto. Yes. It can't be Colorado, where yes they got the win, but it was still a bit uh -huh. too slow at times. They but couldn't move them around. Will fatigue be a factor? This is the third match in seven days, essentially. Uh, I mean, it's gonna be something that uh, we're gonna have to look at. And, and Orlando did not play midweek. Yeah. And so they will be fresher than us. Doesn't mean anything really uh, at the end of the day because this is a derby uh, or a rivalry match uh, if uh, if we go by MLS. And so, yeah, I mean, it will be uh, kind of, you know, the teams are up for it more. So uh, that type of, uh, you know, atmosphere and the players being up for it, 
form goes out the window, as they say. But, um, yeah, let's get into the injuries uh, for Atlanta United. It's still a George Bell that, uh, of course, is out two to three months. You have Kevin Kratz, who probably should be making his way back a little bit uh, now, but still is not in there. And so we still only have essentially the three uh, center midfielders, central midfielders rather, and uh, that still doesn't bode well. But, uh, you know, I think we can make do this kind of week at least, but we desperately need some more bodies in there. Maybe Julian Gressel does have to uh, hop in there eventually. And uh, we see some, you know, other wingers that... Well, that's what Amiram's for, is that exactly. you can bring Amiram in, you can find the wing, and you can sign a Gressel into central midfield. Exactly. But uh, for that, let's get to our predicted 11 for this match. I think you and I are pretty much on board with the same so we'll go through the lines. on this. Yeah. So, 4 2 three, one, I think, for both of us. Agreed. Guzan and Very Net. Very similar to last match, exactly. Guzan and Net, mm -hmm. Escobar, Robinson, LGP, and then I have Parker's coming back in at left back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that makes a lot more sense because of a Nani that might be playing there or if he even you know if he drifts to the, the right side okay Escobar great uh but and Nani will cut in on his right foot yeah make that very clear For he sure. is right footed <laughs> yeah. and uh but and so playing a uh you know a right footed parky against a Nani yes I think he, he, it's more that he uh you know not only is one of the best like positioning wise defenders in MLS uh that does kind of negate a little bit of the maybe um, you know, for the lack of pace that maybe Shea has as well as uh, kind of the errors that he has in him. Uh, I think, yeah, you can't make an error against Nani in this match that, uh, you know, he won't pay, like make you pay for. So uh, I think having agreed, uh, Parky at left back is a wise decision here. Uh, and now getting into midfield, I think it's Nagby, of course. Gotta uh, you, you gotta play the, him this match. It's the matter also, of... The, the trade room was at him just just stupid because how he's playing there is not whatever the cap is at what you can trade for a player within mls is not enough for yeah. what he means to this team mm -hmm. like there no bs there he pretty much i don't runs care how game. much it is yeah. there's nothing any team can offer us within major league soccer that is worth darlington nagby and columbus crew certainly don't have it yeah no they, they definitely certainly don't have it uh i think maybe arguably the the only team that maybe does is like an skc but they don't need them no so, so, because, yeah, they don't have DPs, and so, you know, it's like, you know, that thing. But, um, yeah, so, uh, Tony Nagby starts in the middle, along with a Jeff Loretowitz. Uh, I think uh, Remetti just ran his socks off uh, this did. past match, and um, just coming off of an injury and coming back, I don't think it's wise playing an Eric Remetti, even though he balled out. I mean, he... Oh, yeah, he was yeah, incredible. Yeah, he pretty much had Pozuelo just locked down. He was slipping in some through balls. It was, yeah, he had a hell of a match. But, but you had a lot more matches this month. Exactly. It's a long season. You so. gotta look forward, and I think uh, Jeff, Jeff Lorenowitz is, uh, to a degree, uh, he offers different things, but slightly they're interchangeable to a degree. And if you points. have more of the ball this game, like you would expect, yeah. as opposed to this past match against Toronto, if you have more of the ball, Jeff Lerman is sitting there dropping in between the defenders, mm -hmm. playing that smart positional game and being able to recycle the ball is a great yes. player to have there. And I think he makes sense and fits in really well for this match. Agreed, agreed. But, uh, and then so with the attacking midfielders, uh, the yeah, same. I think it's the same. <laughs> it's going to be Tito, Tito on the left. It's going to be PT in the middle and Gressel on the right. And of course, Joseph up top. Uh, I think, yeah, we saw the combination play that they were able to uh, pull off. We saw the uh, creativity, the pace. Um, I mean, you know, Gressel scoring and Tito scoring offers a ton more, I think, in terms of uh, danger men for Orlando City to worry about as well. And then I think PT, this is just it's a game that's dying for him to break out here because they are you know a team that struggles against skillful players well there's not a more skillful player on the pitch than pt martinez uh of the two teams and i would completely back that hundred thousand percent because uh he's a guy that yeah he will run circles around you and hopefully he does i think once he gets that first goal things yeah. are really going to start yeah going for him once well. he opens that account oh. Uh, and uh, so that gets us to our score prediction 
And uh, yeah, you know, uh, is Joseph scoring? <laughs> so for me, I, I said 3-1. I think Atlanta United are the better team. I don't think Orlando will be able to cope with Atlanta United's sustained attack. I don't think they'll be able to keep their discipline for 90 minutes, mm -hmm. both defensively and in their heads. I think that once Atlanta United scores, once 70,000 people really get going, I just don't think they're good enough to hold oh. out against this team. I think for some reason that the streak of clean sheets has been nice, but something tells me that Orlando is still going to nick a goal at some point in time in this match. Yeah. But 3-1, I think Joseph is going to score one. I think Tito's going to score again. And I think P.T. Martinez gets his first goal for Atlanta United. I like it. I like it. Um, I'm not as bullish, but uh, yeah, I think I agree. It's, it's, I think, yeah, Nani probably has a goal in him probably from, you know, uh, our left side, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, I think we can still, you know, bring the goods pull out a 2-1 win uh, because, yeah, kind of our games are closer than they need to be a lot of times, except for that one. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, still a, you know, really, really good result for us. That makes it four straight if we do, and so hopefully we do. But that gets us to the question of the day. So the question of the day, I'm actually going to ask you as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think P.T. Martinez breaks his duck and finally gets on the score sheet for Atlanta United this Sunday? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, like I said, it bodes well because of what they struggle with. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, just the, the free kicks are like inches, inches away. I think he's got it lined up to where, yeah, I mean, it's... It's I bring primed. out my phone every single time there's a free kick and I just have it sitting there because I'm like, this might be the one he just top bends it. Right, yeah, something might happen. Yeah, it's, it's just one of those, like, he, uh, I think he's feeling it and I think it's coming and boy, do I hope it comes. So, so guys, does PT Martinez break his duck and get his first goal for Atlanta United? Get down in the comments below and let us know what you guys think. Yes, indeed, but... That's it for us today, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already, smash that like button, and share this video because it really does help us a lot. For Tanner McLeod, I'm AJ, thank you guys so much for watching.